one of the most common things we build in Power Apps are editable grids. And these can make a big difference, allowing the user to quickly make updates in place without navigating between screens or forms. Two common areas of improvement with these editable grids are the styling and theming that's used to design the grid, as well as the performance of saving records back to the data source. If the grid isn't easy on the eyes or the app starts to slow down every time a user makes a change, then the experience falls apart. In this video, I'll show you how to build a modern editable grid in Power Apps, one that not only looks polished, but also performs well using the most efficient strategy available. We'll avoid unnecessary updates, unnecessary collections, and we'll make sure that the changes happen fast and reliably. No matter the data source that you're working with, this approach will help your app stay responsive and scale better over time. Here's how we'll approach it. We'll start by building the grid layout using a vertical gallery. Each row in this gallery will include editable controls. And in this case, we'll use controls like text inputs, dropdowns, or checkboxes. This all depends on the types of data found in your data source. After that, we'll add logic to each row to track when a change is made. That way, when the user makes the change, we only patch the updated values instead of overwriting the entire record, triggering multiple unnecessary calls. Finally, we can tie it all together with a clean update experience using a method of patching all these changes without a collection. That means we can avoid making updates to a collection, and every time we patch the data, it's always the correct information. So let's get started. Channel members have access to download the apps used in the videos, as well as the YAML code used in the components that I showcase. You can click the join button below the video if you're interested in supporting the channel. To start off, we'll go ahead and insert a vertical gallery in our template screen. For this gallery's data source, I'll go ahead and connect it to an employee case log list in SharePoint. We'll have some settings to change on our gallery a little bit later, but for now we'll go ahead and change some basic things. We'll left align the gallery and set its width to parent.width. For the gallery's template size, we'll set this to 48, and we'll set the template padding to zero. To organize our fields inside of the gallery, we'll insert a horizontal container into our gallery's items. For this gallery, we want to center align its contents, and we also want to set the gap to 16. This should provide some nice padding between each field in our editable grid. We'll make sure that the X and Y values of this container are set to zero, and for now we'll set the width to parent.template width, and the height to parent.template height. We do want some padding for this container, so we'll set the left and right padding to 12. We don't necessarily want the drop shadow to be shown for this container, but we do want a small border between each of the gallery items to give more of a grid-like experience. So we'll set the border value to 0.5. This is a pretty aggressive color, so we'll go ahead and change the border color to a nice light gray. And we'll also change the border radius to zero. This blends into the background a little bit better than the drop shadow does on its own. You can play around with that border color to match your app's theme. Inside of our container, we'll go ahead and start to insert our fields. The first field is just going to be a plain text field, and this is just going to display the ID column from our SharePoint list. For the text property, we'll set this as this item.id, and we'll middle align the text and reduce the width to 32. Next, we'll insert a text input control. Now, to make this feel more modern, we'll go ahead and set the border radius of this control to 12. And this will be the standard that we use for the other controls inside of our container. For the value of this text input, we'll set this to this item dot case description. Next, we'll insert a modern combo box control. And for this one, we'll go ahead and set the border radius to 12 as well. For the items of this combo box, we'll set this to the choices of our case status column inside of our employee case log SharePoint list. For the default value of this combo box, we'll set it to this item dot case status. Next, we'll insert a modern date picker control. And again, we'll set the border radius to 12. And we'll go to the selected date property and set this to this item dot case closed date. With these fields inserted, we have a grid-like experience that shows each of our three fields, which we can make updates to directly in the gallery. 
To create some headers for our gallery, we'll go to our gallery's parent container and insert another horizontal container. We'll move this container above our gallery and we'll make some changes to it. We'll disable the flexible height option and set the height to 55. We'll center align the controls vertically inside of the container, and we'll also disable the drop shadow and set the border radius to zero. In this case, we want a matching border to our gallery items, so we'll set the border of this to 0.5, and we'll choose the same light gray color as the border color. Inside of this container, we'll insert the same number of text controls as we have fields in our gallery, and we'll change the text of these to let the user know what fields they're updating in the gallery. We'll go ahead and middle align the text of all of these and then set their width to match the width of the controls inside of our gallery. In the parent container of our header labels, we'll also need to set the gap to match the same gap as the container in our gallery, which in this case is 16. And then we'll also set the left and right padding to 12. As a finishing touch for these headers, we'll go ahead and set the font weight to semi-bold. The height of that header looks a little bit too large, so we'll go ahead and reduce the height to 45. So now at this point, we have a grid displayed in our gallery where the user can make changes to all of the fields that we're displaying. Before we patch this data back to SharePoint, we'll go ahead and set up the mechanism that will detect whether the user has actually changed a gallery item. Inside of our horizontal container, we'll insert a toggle. Now the formatting of this toggle doesn't really matter too much because we're going to make it invisible. In the checked property of this toggle, what we're trying to do is detect if the SharePoint values of this record are different than the values of our input controls in the gallery. So for example, if we're trying to detect if case description has changed, we would write this item dot case description, which is the value from SharePoint, is not equal to the name of our text input control, which is text input canvas one dot value. Now in this case, we can see that our toggle has changed because the value of this input control no longer matches the value from SharePoint. After this, we'll insert two pipes, and then we can check if this item dot case status dot value is not equal to combo box canvas one dot selected dot value. And again, this would check if the value of the case status field from SharePoint is different than the currently selected value in this combo box. We can then repeat this for each of our fields and each of our input controls in our gallery. So for the case close date, we'll insert this item dot case close date is not equal to date picker canvas dot selected date. If we play our app, we can change the case status for one of our records and we see that our toggle has changed. We can update the case close date, and now we can see that the toggle is updated. We can update the description, and we can see that also updates the toggle. We do this because we only want to patch the data that's changed from our gallery. We don't want to patch records in this case unnecessarily. With that done, the next thing we can do is tackle our patch. So we'll go ahead and insert a button. Now in our buttons on select property, we'll insert a patch function. Now for this patch, we'll insert our employee case log data source, and then we're prompted to enter the records that we want to patch. We'll use the for all function in this case, and this is how we'll build the records that we want to send back to SharePoint. Our for all function is asking first for a source, and for this, we want to enter a filter function. Inside of this filter, we'll enter the name of our gallery, dot all items. And then we'll enter a comma to enter our logical test for this filter. We want to filter all of the items in this gallery by our toggle dot checked. This is immediately taking out any of the records that haven't been updated because the toggle is not checked. After our filter, we'll enter a comma. And now we're prompted for the formula of our for all. The for all function loops through all of the values provided in the table in the source argument. So in this case, it will perform this formula that we provide it for each of the records from our gallery's filtered items. The formula that we want in this case is to build a record in the schema that we need to patch back to SharePoint. Now, since we're updating records in a data source, we need to provide the ID column from our data source. So in this case for SharePoint, 
we have to start by defining ID. The value of this column will simply be this record.id. The next value in this record will be case description. Now for the value of this column, we want to patch the record from our text input control in our gallery. So we'll reference this record.textInputCanvas1.value. You'll notice that when we're referencing a value from our data source, it's simply this record dot the column name. But when we're trying to update the column with information from our gallery, we're referencing this record dot our controls name and value. Next, we'll insert case status. And for this, we want to patch back this record dot combo box canvas one dot selected. And then lastly, case close date will be this record dot date picker canvas one dot selected date. And our full formula is here. Now, just to recap, we're patching our data source and providing a table using the for all function. This is looping through our gallery items where toggle one is checked, or in other words, something has been updated for that row. We can check the value of this filter and we can see only the four records are shown. Our for all function is looping through each of those records and building a new record with the schema that we've defined here. If we highlight our entire for all function, we can see the values in the table that this returns. We have our ID column with our four records and then the new values that have been selected in our gallery. If I make a change, we can look back at the for all function and see that new record is shown. Now, the second important thing to note is that if you're receiving any errors with this patch function, you may need to switch the names of your columns inside of this record schema to match the logical or backend names of the fields from your data source. With our patch function done, we can go ahead and try this out. After making some changes, we can see our toggles have switched and we can go ahead and click our button to patch these values back to SharePoint. We can see that happen very quickly and our toggles are reset to false to show that the values in these gallery controls match the values from SharePoint. We can refresh our SharePoint list and we can see that those values have been updated. With that done, we can go ahead and hide our toggle as it will still become checked and unchecked even when invisible. Next, we'll look at a small technique that can enhance your user's experience using this grid. In this case, we'll go to our gallery and we'll go to the advanced tab and to the on select property. Here, we'll set a variable called var selected item and the value of this will be this item. In the contents of our gallery, we'll select all of the fields that are editable and we'll set the display mode to check if this item dot ID is equal to var selected item dot ID, then we want the display mode to be edit. Otherwise, it should be view. We'll copy the first part of our if statement. We'll set the background color of our main container to this matching off white color. In this case, RGBA 245, 245, 245, 1. And we'll invert the colors of our screen container so that those are white. We'll go to the appearance of our text input for the case description. And right now it's currently set to the text input canvas dot appearance dot filled darker. Instead of this, we want to paste the beginning of our if statement. And in this case, we want this to be filled lighter if the ID of both of these matches. If not, we'll set this to filled darker. We'll copy the same formula and we'll put that in the appearance of our combo box as well as the appearance of our case close date. Now at this point, the user cannot make changes anymore to the gallery. So to unlock editing, we'll insert an image control into the gallery's item. For this image, we'll remove the sample image. We'll set the X value to zero and we'll set the width to parent.template width and the height to parent.template height. Now in the on select property of this image, by default, it's selecting the parent, which in this case is the gallery, and that will trigger our gallery to set var selected item to this item. If we play the app now, we can see that our fields turn white, and this should allow the user to edit them. 
We'll go back to our image control, and the last thing we need to do here is set the visible property to this item.id does not equal var selected item.id. This will make the image disappear when the user selects that row, and this will allow the user to then make changes to the row. We can select another row, and that unlocks the editing. And after making these changes, we can patch the information back to SharePoint. When the patch is done, we also want to clear that var selected item variable. So we'll insert a set function and set the variable to blank. After the patch is completed, we can see our row is unselected. Inside of our gallery's horizontal container, we'll also insert a button control. For the icon of this button, we'll set this to dismiss. We'll set the layout to icon only, the width to 32, and the type to transparent. In the onSelect property of this button, we'll go ahead and set var selected item to blank. This way, the user can unselect the row that they've selected. In the visible property, we'll enter this item.id equals var selected item.id. If the row is selected, then the X appears to dismiss the selection. Before we clear the variable, we'll also reset each of the controls in the gallery. If the user made a selection and they want to cancel that selection, then the value will get reset to the original value from the data source. One other thing we can do to indicate that this is clickable to the user is go to our image control and then set the tab index to zero. Now our cursor will change to a hand when hovering over our transparent image. And that's about it. A modern, editable grid inside of Power Apps that performs well. We kept the UI clean, tracked only which rows changed, and patched efficiently, all so that our app can stay fast and responsive. If you found this video helpful, consider giving it a like. And if you're interested in more videos like this in Power Apps, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Thanks for watching and have a great day.